I'd like to bloviate for a moment on what makes for a real trumpet. And uh, I'm going to start with a little history lesson about a guy named Herbert Clark, uh, who talked about the new trumpet uh, that uh, was taking the United States by storm. And uh, he said that it had been never seriously used as a, as a, well, basically in his view, as a musical instrument. Now, the instrument he was referring to appeared in the 1880s, and it was a short version of the E flat or F contra alto trumpet. Um, and it looked like Ta-da! This is the instrument he was uh, referring to without knowing it because he didn't know what he was talking about. Um, this instrument appeared in the 1880s and its purpose was to stabilize playing in the high register because composers like Richard Strauss and others were writing parts higher and higher and higher and higher. So you needed shorter and shorter tubing so as not to squeak and squawk and hit crows. And uh, yes, they hit crows in those days, those buggers. But this is the instrument that was used in the classical world. Now, in circa 1910, this instrument appeared. And it was first put out there in catalogs uh, by a uh, con artist and uh, Lion and Healy, they came out at the same time. Now, I'm pretty sure, I haven't been able to nail this down exactly, but I'm pretty sure that the Lion and Healy instrument was a con stencil. Um, I'll make another video about that some other day. But uh, uh, Kenton Scott, his, on his uh, website, Horn Eucopia, was able to nail down the exact year that these things first appeared. This is what uh, Louis Armstrong was playing. Uh, this is what guys were picking up, although th theirs was a flattened, long pea shooter uh, version of this same horn. Um, and Louis Armstrong is one of those who uh, popularized this instrument. Now, here's the thing. When the con artist, uh, Con, first put this out on the market, it came with two mouthpiece receivers. One of them was for the cornet. The other was for the trumpet. And if it came with the trumpet mouthpiece receiver, Con, the con artist, called it a trumpet, if it had a trumpet mouthpiece receiver, and a cornet or long model cornet that came with a uh, cornet mouthpiece receiver. A lot of us older guys remember seeing old <laughs> uh, long model cornets. And some of them had a little curly cue back here to shorten them. They had a little curly cue of tubing back here, some of them. And the others were shaped like this. And uh, guys, all these years later, are still calling these things a trumpet. Well, they're not, and they never were, and they never will be, and here's why. Um, this is a real trumpet. It's cylindrical tubing, and it's conical only through the vowel, uh, the bell bow. Well, bellity bow, bellity bow, bellity bow. Now, boo, 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 boo. It, the Conical tubing starts here and it ends here, and that's all there is. This little piece of tubing uh, is just straight tubing, straight through here, straight through here, straight around here, 
and doesn't start to do anything flourish until it gets to about there. All of this is cylindrical tubing. That's why this is and always has been a trumpet. Now, yeah, let go, let go. This is conical through here, and then again from here until the end, the bitter end. <laughs> So this is a conical instrument. It is, in fact, a cornet. It's always been a cornet. And it's a cornet you play with a trumpet mouthpiece. No baloney. Um, Herbert Clark was an opinionated uh, circus clown performer who played the cornet, uh, especially back in the 19th century. And the cornet was a circus clown's instrument. They played it in tent shows and uh, they would take their cornets and uh, their cornet pistons in the early days and they would jump off a platform 800 feet above the stage twirl around about 800 times and play the flight of the bumblebee at least four times before plunging into a bucket of boiling fat. And that's kind of what these guys did in, uh, in these uh, circus acts. Um, Jenny Lind, the famous singer, uh, sang in those same uh, tent shows. Um, what these guys did, a lot of them were specialists. They had their own special method of playing the cornet. They had their own special um, thing that they were good at. Some guys were super good at tonguing and could tongue like lightning. And that was, you know, you'd come from miles around. Uh, this is, you know, back before radio and back when people were entertaining themselves and knew about acoustic instruments. And if you heard about a guy who could super fast triple tongue, you were going to go out there and droves and buy a ticket and go to one of these circus clown tent shows and see a guy who could tongue like greased lightning. And that was the world of the, uh, cornet back then and that was herbert clark's role well these guys got pretty snooty and uh because the trumpet in those days was uh played parts like da 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 anybody who has played new world symphony knows what i'm talking about that <laughs> <laughs> meanness was inflicted upon trumpet players for a very long time until valves came along. Well, now news for Herbert Clark, uh, the key trumpet a long, long, long ago, uh, around, uh, well, the first fully keyed trumpet by Wingy Dingy Widinger, uh, that appeared around, sometime around uh, 1801, could play a full chromatic scale and could play Haydn's uh, Concerto in E flat. So they were doing their own circus clown stuff at the same time. Now, a word about the key trumpet. It was not invented in 1801. There are examples of trumpets with holes and keys going back to the Renaissance. So caveat, a caution about stuff you hear um, in history class about uh, anything. When you hear a date about something, the truth is usually that some clown has stuck a specific date out there with a specific example of a specific something, and those examples almost invariably turn out to be wrong, but they're there for a good reason. They're there for students to hang their hat on, so I can't say they're, they're completely bad or completely off, and things don't develop. Things don't just pop into existence. Um, if you've ever studied the rules of taxonomy, you will know that things don't just pop into existence. Uh, even in the world of, uh, in brass winds, there is taxonomy uh, because brass winds evolve over time. You have the big, great, big double length B flat trumpet, and then you have the sort of 
compromise the E flat contra alto trumpet, and then you had the B flat trumpet, then you had the little baby E flat. Um, they're very hard to get these days, the, the very good little E flat trumpet. I've got a compromise here. This is an E flat soprano trumpet. Uh, Call that's what it sold as it's really a cornet, but the trumpet version of this with rotary valves is very hard to come by these days. Uh, one of my old teachers, um, Len Whiteley at Douglas College back in the 70s, had a gorgeous one that he, I believe, it may have been the one that he played at Carnegie Hall. But uh, oh, it was a good player, I would have given body parts to just to play that thing, it was uh, such a nice horn. Anyway, so there you have it. Uh, the modern trumpet is not a trumpet. And I'll say it again about the flugelhorn. The modern instrument everybody calls a flugelhorn is not a flugelhorn. It's an infantry model saxhorn. It used to come in a little version in E flat, the bigger version in B flat, and let saxhorns on down. Um, if you ever want to make a saxhorn quartet, that uh, Take two of those, two tenor horns, and a B-flat baritone. And there you go. You've got a sax horn quartet. Um, and that's all I've got to blovia, bloviate about today. Bloviate, I love that word. That's a Mark Twain, by the way. I'm stealing. It's not original to me. It's a Mark Twain. Uh, I don't know what you'd call that, a wordification? I'm going to stick with that for now. Thanks for now. Bye-bye. Happy honking. Or as the Germans say, play your blah, blouser. Horn-shaped thing that makes noise.